Centrifugal pumps. This is one of my favorite <clears throat> topics. Um, <clears throat> every exam that you take in Arizona, there's four grades or four certifications you can get. Water treatment plant operator, water distribution system operator, wastewater treatment plant operator, and wastewater collection system operator. In Arizona, of the four disciplines, you can get four grades in each one. Grade one is the first one, the beginner one. Grade four is the expert or the highest grade that you can get. That's 16 exams. You can bet money that on every one of those 16 exams, there's questions about pumps, centrifugal pumps, and positive displacement pumps. There might be math questions that cover these. And uh, those math questions are gonna be covered in the videos that we have for distribution coming online and then in later subjects. After distribution, we're gonna go into collections. We're start knocking these things out. So this <coughs> is a booster pump station. Behind it, you see a ground storage tank. After the water has been pumped from the, and this is from our system, and our source water is groundwater. So we have several well sites throughout the system. We have several ground storage tanks throughout the system where we store the water that we pump out. Now our storage system is only large enough, and this is ideal, to store enough water to be used within 24 hours. We want to keep that water fresh. Once we disinfect the water, we add a little bit of chlorine to it so that we have a residual. So that we have a residual at the EPDS, which is the entry point to the distribution system, and throughout our distribution system, all the way to the furthest point in the system. So you have multiple sample points. We call this the entry point to the distribution system because this is where the water is being drained out of the ground storage tank, sent through these pumps, a series of pumps that pressurize the system. Our distribution system, ideally, the lowest pressure that we can encounter is 20 PSI. We have to maintain the system above 20 PSI, anywhere in the distribution system. One of the reasons why is because if it falls below 20 PSI, any water that's outside of the distribution system, if there's a leak, can be pushed back into the distribution system. So we're very, very sensitive. Keep in mind our distribution system, it's airtight, it's watertight. We don't want to allow any air or water to get in there that we didn't put there ourselves. Okay, so <clears throat> if that happens, then the water becomes an unknown quality. It is no longer potable. It is no longer safe. And our first job as an operator is to protect the health and safety of our customers. To do that, we have to be assured that the system is watertight, that the water going out is being tested and monitored very closely to ensure that the water is safe. So the water, and you can see here, the water drains out of the tank and it comes into the bottom part right here. Now, what we call this is positive suction head. The water level in the tank is up here somewhere. And water, because it's so heavy, 8.34 pounds per gallon, Gravity is pulling it down. Gravity is trying to pull the water all the way down to the ground, right? <clears throat> so because water is heavy, it has, it's, it's exerting head pressure on these pumps. This installation of pumps is designed to maximize positive suction head. That means that the volutes of every pump, and, and when you look at this, you see a whole lot of mechanical stuff going on here. The pump itself is right here. It's just that one, one part. The actual pump is right here. This is the motor that turns the impeller on the pump. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But the force of gravity is pushing down on the water, creating head pressure, which pushes the water this way through this pipe and primes every pump. These pumps have to remain primed. The volute of the pump has to be full of water for these to operate. If it's not, they cavitate, they fail, it destroys the pumps. The pumps take the water in, 
and discharge it at a 90 degree angle. The water is going up through this 90 into this, into this pipe, and it goes out into the distribution system. We call this the entry point to the distribution system, the EPDS. And right here you see we have a sample port. We have a what we call a zero point uh, magnetic flow meter. So we're metering all the water that leaves this site, that leaves this booster pump station. And it, we call it a zero point because normally a magnetic flow meter, it needs a certain distance upstream and a certain distance downstream of water that's flowing nice and smooth and straight uh, to get accurate reads. But this flow meter, this flow meter is designed to work in just the lay length of the meter. It's, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's well worth it because you see here, it's jammed up against that 90 where the water's flowing down. And here we have the sample port. That's the EPDS, the entry point to the distribution system. That's the sampling point. <clears throat> Here's a really great picture of a centrifugal pump in that booster pump station. This is the type of centrifugal pump and there's several different types, several different uses, but this is a very good example. This gray or black section, that's the electric motor that drives the pump, that turns the impeller. What you see here in silver is actually, it, that's the pump. More specifically, the impeller that's inside the volute here, the volute is part of the pump casing that houses the impeller. If you were to cut it in half, you would see that it looks kind of like a snail. The water flows in this way, and as the impeller turns, it's like a fan blade or a propeller. As it turns, it forces the water in a circle using a centrifugal force. If I take a five gallon bucket with a handle and I put a gallon of water in it and I turn it upside down, that's gravity, right? Gravity is dumping the water out. But if I take a gallon of water and I put it in that empty five gallon bucket and I pick up the handle and I spin it around in a circle, the water will stay in the bucket if I go fast enough. The water will stay in the bucket. Why? That's centrifugal force. That's the force of, that's the force of uh, spinning that around and pushing that water to the bottom of the bucket and keeping it there as it goes around that arc. Centrifugal force is, is used to spin the water as it comes in, it spins around the balut, well, it actually spins this way, spins the water around the balut, and which opens up like a snail to this opening. It discharges at a 90 degree angle. It comes in at four feet per second. It gets spun around and discharged out at seven feet per second. So we're gonna talk about the uh, internal components of the pump here in a moment. Centrifugal pumps are used for high flow and low head pressure applications. Booster pumps are required to move high volumes of water and usually operate at low head pressures. Centrifugal pumps are ideally suited to these types of applications and are much more efficient than positive displacement pumps of comparable size. So let's talk about low pressure and high pressure. A centrifugal pump, the, <clears throat> the higher the pressure against the pump, the lower the flow. That's one of these things about a centrifugal pump. It's very sensitive to the pressure that it has to pump against. And that's a key way of understanding it. It has to pump against a certain pressure. Okay, so centrifugal pumps are very uh, sensitive to pressure. So <clears throat> when a pump is pushing water into a pipe, you have back pressure. The diameter of the pipe, the smoothness of the inside of the pipe, the length of the pipe, the material the pipe is made of, these all affect the back pressure against the pump. So, <clears throat> Um, we want our booster pumps to maintain system pressures between 20 PSI and 70 PSI. At 20 PSI, we're keeping, that's the minimum amount of water pressure that we want to deliver to every customer in our distribution system. 
one of those reasons is because it's still a good pressure. You can shower and bathe with it and you feel like you're getting adequate water. Another reason is because at less than 20 PSI, you risk infiltration into your distribution system. The pressure inside the pipe is not enough to keep the water that might be outside of the pipes. If there's a leak, it can push its way into your distribution system and contaminate your distribution system. 70 PSI is really the limit. We want to keep it under 70 PSI as much as possible because greater than 70 PSI can lead to excessive wear on your customer's water appliances. We're talking water heaters, water softeners, things like that. <coughs> Centrifugal pumps are really great. And what's really great about that is they can move a lot of water very quickly. They're very good at that but they can only do it against a certain amount of pressure. So as I was talking about the, the pipe, that back pressure on the pipe, if the pressure is very high, it reduces the GPMs the pump can deliver, the gallons per minute. That's how we uh, evaluate the, um, the capacity of the pump, is how many GPMs is it gonna be able to move at a certain pressure. And every pump, every centrifugal pump has a pump curve. We can look at that and say, hey, if we know the pressure is at 60 PSI, then we know that the pump will deliver a certain GPM. And we can look at the pressure at the booster pump station and say, well, the pressure is at 70 PSI right now. If the flow meter is not working and giving you the adequate GPM you're looking for, you can look at the pressure and look at the pump curve and say, well, it looks like I'm getting so many gallons per minute right now according to the pump curve. So this is going to demonstrate that here we have the suction. So one thing to note too is every pump has a suction side and a discharge side. The suction side is where the water enters the pump. The discharge side is where it's leaving the pump. So here we have a cutaway and you see what I was talking about with that snail look to it. As the water comes in, it enters through the impeller eye. The impeller spins the water around, building up centrifugal force to discharge it at a 90 degree angle. <clears throat> like a baseball machine. Yep. Uh, rotates yeah, pretty much. Ball, rotates through, grabs the ball, and pitches it. Yep. We're going to go ahead and move on because we're going to talk about all those different things. Now let's get back to talking about, uh, so centrifugal pumps are different than positive displacement pumps. Positive displacement pumps, um, well, I'll just read. A positive displacement pump displaces a known quality of liquid for every revolution or cycle the pump completes. Think of a piston in the engine, right? You have a piston, you have a cylinder or the piston that moves up and down within the cylinder or the block, the engine block, right? So as it moves down, it opens up the volume. It empties the chamber. As it moves up, it reduces the volume in that chamber. It's forcing something out. What a positive displacement pump does is effectively the same thing. With every revolution or every cycle, Something opens and it draws in a liquid, a chemical that we use to treat the water. It fills the chamber and then as the piston closes or the closure element moves and forces the liquid out, you get the same quality quantity every time. As long as you have plenty of chemical, you'll get the same dose with every revolution. Like a bike pump. Yeah, kind of, yeah. So, we're using a liquid solution to treat the water and maybe that's chlorine maybe it's magnesium hy hydrochloride hydrochloride uh some type of ferric acid something any type of chemical treatment we're going to use a positive displacement pump because we're treating with a very specific amount you know and whether those revolutions are three times a minute or 60 times a minute or some other uh, rate we know exactly how much we're dosing into the flow 
All right. The flow rate through a positive displacement pump is directly proportional to its speed and the number of cycles over a given time. So that's revolutions per minute, RPMs. In the water industry, positive displacement pumps are typically utilized as chemical feed pumps. So here's the piston. <clears throat> there's the crank and the connecting rod. Every time the crank moves, it's opening the piston, closing the piston. When it opens, a check valve opens up to allow the chemical in. Because of the way the check valve is placed, it's going to allow chemical in when the piston is opening. When the piston is opening, this check valve right here on the outlet side is going to close. So this is the suction side, this is the discharge side. When it opens, this check valve opens, allowing the chemical in. As soon as it starts to close, this check valve slams shut. This one opens and allows the chemical out on the discharge side. That's a piston. This is a diaphragm. This is a cutaway of a diaphragm pump. So instead of a piston, now you have this rubber diaphragm. <clears throat> Every time it turns, it pulls the diaphragm. It's like a suction cup. It pulls back. When it closes, it slams shut against the th thrust block. And it works in the same way. You have a check valve at the bottom, a check valve at the top. In this case, you have two ball checks. These are little balls that are inside a, a case or inside a container. Uh, it, as the water on the suction side goes up through there, the valves are open. As the diaphragm pulls back, it opens up the checks. It allows the water in or the chemical in. When the diaphragm slams shut, this checks, these checks open up and allow the, uh, the chemical to move and be discharged from the diaphragm. This is a peristaltic pump, a positive displacement pump. So you have the suction side, the discharge side, the chemical is being fed from this direction through a hose. This is a, a hose that goes around, it's very flexible, but very tough. As this, this, this uh, piece right here, it, it spins. It slowly spins, or you can speed it up. It can spin very quickly. But as it spins, you see that as it moves this way, it's crimping down on the, on the hose. Between this point and this point, you have a known quantity, a specific volume of chemical in that. That's the dose. There's one here, too. So as this spins, is discharging it out and this roller right here is going to force everything out of the hose as this roller comes down it's going to pinch the hose as the two as the hose is filling with the chemical solution it's going to pinch it down keep it between these two rollers move it around and discharge it away these are examples of positive displacement pumps it's a known quality call it a known quantity of chemical for every revolution. So let's get back to centrifugal pumps. This is a really nice cutaway of a pump. And you see that this is the impeller eye. That's where the water enters the volute. Here in this section, you're gonna have wear rings. Wear rings are between the impeller eye on the volute and the impeller. We want those tolerances to be very, very close. The closer they are, without allowing things to get jammed up, the more efficient the pump works. So we want this pump to be very efficient. And centrifugal pumps, unfortunately, are not the most efficient pumps out there, but they work really well as they were designed. So here we have what's called the impeller. The impeller is the heart of a centrifugal pump. That's important to know that the impeller is the heart of the centrifugal pump. And as it spins, it's creating centrifugal force. It spins the water around the volute, which opens up like a snail and discharges at a 90 degree angle. The water's coming in at four feet per second and being discharged away at seven feet per second. That's how a centrifugal pump is designed. 
Back here, we'll have a seal behind the impeller, between the impeller and the motor, you'll have a seal. We want to keep the water inside the volute, not in the motor. Water is bad for motors, electric motors, right? So that seal is either going to be packing or it's going to be a mechanical seal. Packing is a rope-like material, usually a square braided stock. So imagine a shoelace, but instead of flat, it's braided like a square into a square. So it's square braided stock <clears throat> infused with some type of lubricant like Teflon is very, very common. And you'll put one or several rings of packing inside there and it'll be adjusted with a packing gland. That's the piece of equipment that presses down on the packing to make sure it's watertight or as watertight as you, the manufacturer rec recommends. That'll keep the water from going back along the pump shaft through the coupling and into the motor shaft. So you have a pump shaft and a motor shaft and they're connected with a coupling. If you think about it, a lot of these parts in a pump are machined to a very, very tight degree. They gotta be very, very uh, precisely machined. And because of that, they're very expensive. When I use words like that, like precise machining, that means it's getting more and more costly, right? The coupling is a throwaway part. They cost 25 cents. Well, before COVID, they were probably 25 cents each to make. Since COVID, they're probably now 50 bucks. So, <laughs> but the thing is, is that they're less expensive than everything else. And this is how we attach the pump shaft to the motor shaft. We take these very two expensive pieces, we gotta connect them together, we do that with a coupling. That's very expensive. It's designed to fail before something expensive fails. That's the designed failure point, <clears throat> is the coupling. <clears throat> Along the shaft, you have bearings. You have uh, bearings on the motor shaft, so as the motor is spinning, it's spinning free and clear, Hopefully we're following our maintenance procedures. Some bearings you never ever have to grease and some bearings you have to grease on a regular schedule and the manufacturer is going to tell you when that is and how often that is, what type of grease you're going to use. And you have to be very careful and we're going to go into this on the maintenance side, but you never ever ever want to over lubricate a bearing. If you over, the, the most common failure for bearing, failure, excuse me, the most common failure for bearings is over lubrication. Sorry, my brain sometimes gets going faster than my mouth. So let's go just one more look at the parts again. This diagram is, is showing you. In this type of pump, it has a stuffing box over here with the rings of packing. And you know what? Nothing's better than actually seeing the real thing. Um, the types of pumps that use packing, that's a much older technology. In our system, we don't have these types, um, but uh, but it's important to know. It's important to know because they are out there. And one of the reasons why you're seeking certification is to improve your resume. You need to know about these types of pumps and valves that have packing. It makes you a better operator, especially if you are speaking with an operator who's working in a system somewhere else and they do have this, you might have questions. What's this rope? What are these shoelaces? What's this, these braided stock that's on my pump? Oh, that's your stuffing. That's your seal, right? <clears throat> so again, water comes in. This is the suction side of the pump. Comes in through the impeller eye. Wear rings keep the um, impeller and the volute. The tolerance is very close. The closer they are, the more efficient the pump. It keeps water from circulating into the low pressure sides of the pump. The low pressure is gonna be up here, the high pressure is gonna be at the end. You want the water to move in and out very quickly. You don't want water to move in and get circulated through the pump in different parts before it gets ejected out. The wear rings help you do that. 
This is the impeller, the heart of a centrifugal pump. This is the volute, which houses the, it's part of the pump casing that houses the impeller. And it's um, attached to your motor with a mechanical seal or packing. The pump shaft and the motor shaft are connected using a coupling and bearings keep everything run smoothly. Number one, what is the most common type of pump used in the water industry today? Centrifugal. Centrifugal is the most common type of pump used in the water industry. That's the water side and the wastewater side. It's used most frequently because it can move a large volume of water in a very short period of time. Centrifugal pumps are best for this flow and this pressure applications. So e, high, and low. High flow and low pressure. Remember, centrifugal pumps are very sensitive to pressure. The more pressure against the pump, the less water it will flow. So if you have a pump that only has to work against, say, 40 PSI, you might get a thousand gallons it might the pump might push a thousand gallons a minute let's say it's got to work against 70 psi at 70 psi and this is the back pressure from the pipe that the, the pump is pushing the water down if it's 70 psi it might only be 600, 600, 750, 800 GPMs. There are 1,440, 1,440 minutes in a day. If your flow is reduced by two, three, 400 gallons per minute over the course of the day, that adds up to a lot of gallons of water, right? Yeah. The more water you can push, the more efficient you are as long as you're pushing the water in a way that the system is designed to take. You know, that's something you have to consider. And it sounds really cool that, man, I can buy this other pump that can move 3,000 gallons a minute at 40 PSI or 70 PSI. Let's just get that one. Well, our system might not be designed to take that. You don't want to move water through your system if it's not designed to move such high volumes of water. The reason why is because water erodes things. Mm -hmm. The very act of water running through pipe erodes the insides of the pipe and the valves and everything else that we have attached to it. So just because you can do it doesn't mean you, you can or you should because you can destroy your, the inside, your distribution system from the inside out if you're moving water through there very, very quickly. That's all stuff we're going to go through in a later. No, just to re, uh, re cap on that, we don't want high pressures. Is it because of the orientations of the impeller and there's pressure against it? <clears throat> or is it just basically because of how the water is being turned up to a 90 degree? So you I, want low pressures. You want low pressures because, well, it, ju it just depends on the application. Mm -hmm. You know, low pressure on one pump might be high pressure on another pump. You know, so at that just at that booster pump station over here, we want to keep system pressures between 20 psi and 70 psi. And sometimes to do that, we have to pump at 100 psi. We have to push against 100 psi to build up that pressure on the front end to deliver 20 psi to the back end. No, I understand that. But centrifugal pumps are saying that they were uh, sensitive to pressure. So right. the inlet is on, under high pressure, say 100 psi. Yeah. It's going to lower the flow coming out of it. Right. Why is that? Why is that? Because um, that's a good question. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, you know, the question or the answer has always been because that's the way centrifugal pumps are designed mm -hmm. um, because they have to move a large volume of water. And so they're designed and there's pump curves that are created by each manufacturer for every model of pump they make. They, they design and make a pump and before they start selling it, they come up with pump curves and say, this pump will operate, it'll deliver X GPMs under this total head or pressure. 
which can be told, you know, head can be uh, uh, converted to pressure. And the reason why they do that is because, you know, every distribution system is different. You know, out here, we have a distribution system that uses 12 inch, a 12 inch distribution main, which reaches out to the distribution system. And as the water gets further out in the distribution system, the diameter of the pipe is reduced so that you maintain certain pressures. No, 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 we want the questions. Um, so as you're pushing water down that pipe, it's creating back pressure. So you need a pump that's designed to pump water against pressure, especially if it's a known pressure. I mean, I can make, uh, I, me personally, I can't. I can buy a pump That'll move 3,000 gallons of water under 500 PSI. It's gonna be a very expensive, very big pump. But does that mean that it's the best pump for my application? No, it's not. Why, it, it, it basically comes down to, because of the size and the horsepower and the, the diameter of the pump, the size of the impeller, the type of impeller it is, how much water can it push against a certain pressure? It's not that, it's not that, you can just buy any pump off the shelf and throw it into a system and say, well, this is how much pressure it has against it. Why isn't it giving me more flow? It's because the pump is designed to deliver a certain GPM at a certain pressure. You know, it's, and bigger isn't always better. <laughs> so, you know, the, there are pump manufacturers, depending on the application, that I prefer over others. There are pumps that I think are superior over all others. On the collection side, <clears throat> we have several lift stations out in our system, and at, except for a very few, at nearly every lift station, we have flight pumps in operation. Because, and I will say this without any shame, flight pumps are the best pumps in the industry. They're the most dependable, longest lasting. We know from the previous utility that they installed flight pumps in some of these lift stations and then forgot about them. They never went back and maintenanced them. Just recently, we had two pumps that we had to pull out of a lift station that had been there for 20 years with almost no maintenance. The only time they pulled them was to clear out the blue because maybe something got stuck in there. That was it. They didn't check the amps. They didn't send them in for rebuild. They didn't do any, and those pumps worked They've operated for 20 years. They're really great. There's not many pumps that can do that out there in the system or out there in the world, in the industry. Um, I have a few other lift stations that have other brands of pumps. And, you know, I have two lift stations, three, let's see, one, two, three lift stations that have one certain brand of pump. And we've maintained them as closely as we could to the manufacturer's recommendations. And those pumps are starting to fail. They're only four years old. We have another lift station, oh, they're, excuse me, they're five years old. We have another lift station that has a completely different brand of centrifugal pump. Um, <clears throat> and those pumps have lasted four years and now they need to be replaced, even though they've been maintained the way they're supposed to. So, you know, it depends on the, there's so many different factors involved in this, um, but these centrifugal pumps are designed to pump a certain flow at a certain pressure. When you go outside the curve, to the left or the right, then you start getting into problems, you're gonna wear out the pump very, very quickly. That's why you have to take extra, extra time and attention to get the proper pump for the application. The, the easiest answer to your question is because that's the design of the pump. Number three, what type of pump would most likely be used for chemical solutions? Jedediah? Be positive displacement pump. Positive displacement pumps. Number four, this is considered the heart of a centrifugal pump. Right. It's the impeller. It's the impeller. Deep. You notice how I keep bringing that up? Yeah. There's certain things I keep repeating over and over again. It's because I want them to set with you guys. Number five, this houses the impeller. George? The volute. The volute. Part of the pump casing that houses the impeller. 
Number six, what part of the centrifugal pump has the function of separating the high pressure zone in the volute from the low pressure zone at the impeller's eye? Adrian? Wear rings, A. <clears throat> exactly, wear rings. They're also called wearing rings. Um, wear rings or wearing rings, depends on who you talk to. <clears throat> um, they come in different, you know, some are uh, a metal or some are a plastic or a Teflon. Or it's just they come in different sizes, shapes, applications. But they're wearing rings or wear rings. Number seven, even in the event of a fire, distribution pressures should never drop below Jedediah. We do tests for this and it's A, 20 PSI. 20 PSI. Okay, let's talk about suction head. Suction head is the ideal method to prime a centrifugal pump. A centrifugal pump, the volute that houses the impeller, it has to remain primed for it to work. If it's not primed, it's not going to pump water. If it's partially primed and there's air in there, it's going to cavitate. Cavitation occurs when microscopic bubbles of air develop on the veins of the impeller. They exist for microseconds. And they're microscopic, they exist for microseconds, but the thing is, is they're like little bombs. They develop, they explode. They develop, they explode. And as they explode against the impeller, which is a very expensive piece of equipment because it's precisely machined to be balanced and to be very, very efficient. <clears throat> Every time they explode against the metal pieces of the volute or the impeller, they take a little tiny microscopic piece of that away. Now in a later video, I'm going to show you evidence of cavitation on an impeller and you're going to see that the blades or the veins at the edges have just been completely destroyed by cavitation, by these bubbles of air. <clears throat> so it's very, very important that the volute is always primed. The best way to maintain prime is positive suction head. You develop and build an installation with positive suction head. That means the, the source of the water, which would be here in this area, is always above the center line of the pump. The center line is going to be right down the middle of the impeller. So if the water source is up here, gravity is going to deliver that water to the pump and it's going to keep the volute primed. Suction lift is when you have the source of the water you're pumping is below the center line of the pump. The pump has to work to pull the water up to it, keep the volute primed, and then pump the water away. <clears throat> so with positive suction head, I have the source water or the water being pumped is above the center line of the pump. Gravity is the energy source that's delivering the water to the pump and keeping the volute primed. When I have the water be that's being pumped is below the center line of the pump. Wait, just jump back. Whoop, went the wrong way. Okay. When the source of the water is below the center line of the pump, the pump has to work. It takes energy, electrical or mechanical energy, to pull the water up to the center line of the pump keep the volute primed and then pump the water away. So you have positive suction head, negative suction head. Negative suction head is also called suction lift. Suction lift exists when the water supply is below the center line of the pump and increases the likelihood the pump will lose prime. It increases the likelihood that the pump is going to cavitate and cavitation means death for a pump. Death and destruction, a slow painful death horrible. Never ever do that to your pumps. Loss of prime occurs when water drains out of the blue and impeller. <clears throat> A foot valve or check valve is usually installed at the bottom of the suction pipe 
to retain prime in the pump installations with negative suction head. When the pump is removed from service, the blute should be drained. Okay, these important points, you have to understand that. <clears throat> so right here in this area, on this pump installation, you have a pump here, the center line, it's under positive suction head. So the blute is always full of water. If I need to take this out of service, I'm gonna isolate it right here at that valve. I'm gonna isolate it so water will only come to this isolation valve and no further. Then I'll take a foot valve that'll be on the blute at some point. I'll open that up and drain the water out of the blute. This is a very important lesson to learn because when I first started in this industry, <clears throat> uh, the first water plant I worked at, uh, very, very quickly after I started working there, we had to take down a booster pump. We had to take it out of service so we could rebuild it. And I learned, unfortunately, the hard way that if I don't drain the balute, the water in this section of piping here is going to go septic. So we had to take the pump out of service. And what we did is we just shut down the pump, isolate it, and left it there because we didn't have the replacement parts on, on hand and in stock. We had to order those, and those were several weeks out. Once they came in, my partner and I went over there and we unbolted the pump to remove it. When we did that, a bunch of septic water came out. So septic water had built up inside the balute and it started deteriorating the inside of the, boot, the balute and the piping. So we had to pressure wash all that out. After we removed the pump, we pressurized, pressure washed the inside of the balute and the piping to clean out all that septic material. And then we disinfected it with just a sprayer. But, uh, but yeah, I learned that the hard way. So you take a pump out of service, you always want to drain out the balute after you isolate it off, okay? Um, we call that a foot valve. It can also be a check valve. Yep, I wanna make sure I touched on every point there. So question number eight, when the water supply for the pump is located below the center line of the pump, and where are we at, Jed and I? Yep. Sure. Uh, C, negative suction head. Negative suction head when it's below the center line of the pump. Negative suction head, which is also called suction lift. Number nine, when the water supply for the pump is located above the center line of the pump, we call that? Positive suction head. Positive suction yes. head. Number 10, never drain the volute, even when the pump is removed from service. B, false. That is false. That's a bold-faced lie right there. That's a trick. Don't do it. Okay, let's talk about <clears throat> vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. What you're looking at here is a, is a, is a wellhead. So we have, in fact, on this installation, it looks like two of them, two wellheads. These are the motors. And these are pretty tall. If you were standing next to them, these would probably be about nine feet tall. So these are pretty beefy. That's a technical term I use. Beefy. Beefy, yeah. I'm trying to get that to gain popularity. <laughs> These are the electrical systems, the SES, or the, the panels, the main panels that are used to energize the pumps. To, and that typically on these panels, especially for our utility, we have several points where we are drawing information from. We want to make sure that the system is running primarily. Is it on or off? How much water is flowing? What's the pressure? What's the temperature of the mechanical components? Things like that. What's the level of the ground storage tank? So imagine in a ground storage tank, the water, gravity is forcing the water out. So when the pumps kick on and water can drain out, all of a sudden the gravity starts pushing down, is always pushing down on the water but when a pump kicks on, water starts leaving the ground storage tank. If it dips to a certain level, which might be six feet from the bottom of the tank, a vortex develops and it starts sucking air 
into the line. And if that air gets to the pumps, it can start causing cavitation. Cavitation, very good. Cavitation is bad. Cavitation destroys pumps, impellers, and the equipment that goes with it. Because once that starts cavitating, it's also vibrating. And when you look at these, you have a lot of flanged parts and pieces. You have valves and you have other components that are sensitive to vibration. Vibration, vibration will destroy your infrastructure. Okay. A vertical, vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. <clears throat> they consist of multiple impellers staged on a vertical shaft. The impellers are designed to bring water in at the bottom and discharge it out the top to the next impeller in the series. I'm going to show you a picture of them here in a moment. Stacking the impellers in these pumps can create very high discharge pressures. And in this case, that's good. The pressure increases as the water moves through each stage. So as I'll show you the diagram here in a moment. High discharge pressures push water long distances, and that's what we're looking for. Because these water well sites or these well sites are usually dispersed through the system to save money. We will, instead of building a ground storage tank right there at the site, we'll build a tank farm maybe miles away and pipe the water all the way there, the raw water. So the pump will pull the water from the groundwater supply, the aquifer, and send it miles away. Or you might have a ground storage tank on the site a booster pump station that energizes the distribution system right there at the well site. You could have one or the other. So here's a good diagram of a vertical turbine centrifugal pump. <clears throat> this is the type of vertical turbine centrifugal pump that you see where just in that previous picture you can see the motor and the top part of the pump at, at grade or at, at ground level. It's got a long, a long, long shaft and these could be designed for an individual application. Um, they might be, you know, the groundwater level might be 20 feet below grade in some locations, and other locations is hundreds of feet. So what this diagram shows you, and the main point of this is, this is the suction side of the pump, down at the bottom here. It's open down here. In fact, there's like a screen over the end to keep sand and gravel out. Um, but the water is pulled in here at the suction side and it goes through this first bowl. We call these, and on this example, there's four bowls. Each bowl is a volute. Each volute houses an impeller. So you have one, two, three, four. These are all designed to be equal. They're the same. So each one is spinning at the same rate, the same RPM, because they're all in the same pump shaft. Again, you have a pump shaft that runs up to a coupling. The coupling transitions from a pump shaft to a motor shaft. The coupling is designed to break before a shaft breaks. As the water gets pumped in through this impeller, it goes to the next impeller, and then the third and the fourth in this example. There might be two, there might be 10, but these are um, uh, these pumps or these impellers are designed and let's say just as a quick example maybe I can pump a thousand gallons a minute at 60 psi well each one of these is designed to pump a thousand gallons a minute that's not going to change no matter how many of these bowls I have what's going to change is the head pressure So if the pressure here is 60 PSI, it's going to build up with each stage. It's going to double up. So 60, 80, 120, or excuse, excuse me, 180, and on up, okay? But what that means is as the same amount of flow, 1,000 GPM, is going through the pump, it's going with more head pressure. It's going to take, that pump is going to allow that water to go all the way up to grade and then discharge out to get to the ground storage tank, which like I said, it could be on site, it could be miles away. But that's what we're trying to do is pull the water from the groundwater supply and then send it a long distance or a certain distance away. You have to have enough energy to do all that. 
So here's two examples of vertical turbine centrifugal pumps. We can also call these multi-stage pumps. This is the vertical turbine centrifugal where at this point everything is above grade. This is a submersible centrifugal vertical turbine pump. The motor is here. It's the first thing that goes down in the well. The motor is attached to the multi-stage pump. Okay? So you have an electric motor and a multi-stage pump. This goes down the wellhead first and the piping is attached to the top of the pump here. So the water gets sucked in here, pushed through these multi-stages up into the pipe that's holding this whole apparatus in the well. And it forces the water up inside. So this is installed in a pump casing slides down and pushes the water inside another pipe. They're less efficient. They're submersible centrifugal vertical turbine pumps are less efficient than the ones that you would find on the ground. But sometimes they're better. And that's because maybe the casing might be misaligned. If the casing is misaligned, it doesn't matter so much as long as we can dump, as long as we can install that submersible unit below ground and it gets down to the level that we want it at then it doesn't matter if the pump casing is misaligned, right? If it's off a little bit at certain sections. But this pump is more susceptible to misalignment. If, it, if there's misalignment, it doesn't like that because it's one unit that goes straight down. So. <clears throat> 11, this type of pump is used to pull water from a well or send reclaimed water a long distance. Where are we at? Adrian. D, multi-stage pump. Multi-stage pump. Number 12, the submersible vertical turbine pump and the vertical turbine pump are examples of... Jedi? A, multi-stage centrifugal pumps. Multi-stage centrifugal pumps. Very good. So I like, not like to say D. Yeah, you like words. Big words. words used by people who want to sound smart. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bert. <laughs> All right. That's your primer into such fuel pumps. Nice. Guys, I appreciate your time today. We've been here several hours. We've gone oh through God. several lectures. This was the, uh, the last one of the day. Thanks for coming out. That was a big one. Thanks to our director for providing breakfast burritos. And the good man is to do this. <laughs> appreciate you guys. Thank you.